Professor B.F. Skinner is very much in the news these days as who wouldn't be who just wrote a book announcing that we're going to have to do away with individual freedoms and throw away the superstition of the dignity of man. Mr. Skinner, granted, exercises a special leverage on public opinion, or more precisely, academic opinion. He appears to be by far the most influential psychologist uh, in America and probably in the world, uh, accepted, if not as the founder of behaviorism, certainly as the man who has done the most to systematize it and most recently to draw out the social implications of it. Uh, con concerning his uh, skills as an experimental psychologist, there is no division of opinion. Concerning his utopian fancies, explained first in his novel, Walden II, now in his best-selling, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, there is considerable difference of opinion, it being the position of at least one of his critics, that Mr. Skinner has done his best to take us down the road to hell. Mr. Skinner is at Harvard University. Professor Donald Mackay is at the University of Kiel in England. He is a physicist, a man of science, uh, whose books include analog computing at ultra-high speed and Christianity in a mechanistic universe. Far from believing that we need a technology to control human behavior, uh, he believes that there is, to quote the title of yet another of his books, room for freedom of action in a mechanistic universe. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Skinner to spend just a moment on the question, is it your assumption that your program will be accepted by the exercise of free will or disbelieving in free will? Are you talking about something that is bound to happen, would indeed have happened irrespective of whether you had ever written your book? Yes, I'm sure it's something that I can't say is bound to happen, but if it happens, it will happen because of a kind of evolutionary process. I believe that we have begun to understand more about uh, human behavior and that once this understanding is available, we are going to design a, a more effective culture. Now, we may not do that. Our culture may simply perish because there are reasons why we, we cannot. I've forgotten the exact dates, but I think it was around 1300 that China and the West were quite on a par with technology. China had invented the, the compass, movable type, and gunpowder. But the Chinese culture did not permit any of this to be used. It was illegal to take long voyages and so on. But the West picked up these techniques, and 300 years later, we had all of Western science and technology and exploration, while China had not moved a bit. Now, that shows what can happen when you have an instrument of power, but don't use it. And my argument is that the traditional concepts of freedom and dignity may very well stand in the way of our next step, which is, I think, an inevitable step provided it can happen, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen because, as in evolution and biology, there are extinct species, and there are, of course, extinct cultures. And, and what exactly is the argument for, uh, uh, for attempting to achieve the next uh, uh, step in well, the progression? Well, I don't think it's an arguable point. I think it is built into the human organism that it will take this step unless something happens to prevent it. I think the traditional struggle for freedom has not been due to any love of freedom or any basic philosophical principle about the goodness in freedom, but simply modifications of, and, uh, of part of the genetic endowment of the human species to free oneself from certain kinds of, of aversive, coercive, punitive conditions. This includes uh, freeing oneself from the annoyances of life, which physical technology takes care of, or to free oneself from uh, punitive control by other people, by the hands of despots and tyrants. Well, the, uh, uh, to, to, to the extent that you can say, corporately speaking, that it is built into the genetic, genetic uh, evolutionary uh, impulse, a desire to uh, survive, does your system provide uh, a value, uh, uh, d d d does it provide a value reference which 
makes survival in and of itself desirable, or are you simply acquiescing in a biological imperative? I'm, I'm accepting survival as a value, uh, as it was demonstrated first, I think, in evolutionary theory. There was no particular point in advance of saying this is a good genetic endowment. The genetic endowment that we have arrived through a selective action, not through design, and I believe that more effective cultures will, will arise through selective action, but not because someone in advance says this is going to be good for the human race. And effective is defined how in your vocabulary? By survival. Oh. If a culture which develops practices which enable it to meet current contingencies and, of course, to take care of conflict with other cultures will necessarily be more likely to survive. Now, it may not, but it will be more likely to survive. And that so far as I can see, is the only value according to which we're going to be judged, no matter how much we might prize some other. Well, but is, is, do, do you, is, is this, uh, uh, is, is this uh, a value which you superordinate over other values uh, as the result of the, of the, um, uh, of, of the metaphysics of your system, no. or is it something that you opt to put ahead of other values? No, quite. Um, we do not choose survival as a value. It chooses us. I see. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Mr. Mackay, how do you uh, bounce off these uh, rather, uh, uh, rather extraordinary assertions? Well, I think we're going to have to work hard to avoid scrambling a number of issues here. Can I take just a minute sure, to sure, sure. try and sort them out? I think, <clears throat> first of all, there's the question whether scientific theory, and particularly deterministic psychological theory at any level, my own is brain physiology rather than experimental psychology, uh, whether science in this sense has exploded the concept of freedom, whether, you know, determinism has made freedom out of date. That's have, one issue. Have you come to a conclusion as regards that? My own conviction is that all the arguments that people have put up alleging that freedom of action uh, is a a myth that's been exploded, uh, all these arguments are fallacious, that on the contrary, uh, freedom of action in a certain quite precise sense uh, is a fact that you can demonstrate if you think it through. But not but, to Mr. Skinner's satisfaction. Well, that remains to be seen, perhaps. Not My yet. point is, though, we have to... Maybe you'll convert before this. Well, you never know. We haven't <laughs> tried this out on each other yet. But. Um, my point is there's quite a different issue, you see, which I think is the one that uh, Skinner's book is mostly about. Uh, namely, suppose you allow or at least set on one side uh, the question whether uh, freedom is real and not exploded by mechanistic determinism. Can we afford it? I think we must keep those two quite separate right. because Skinner in many ways uh, convinces uh, his readers that unbridled freedom, at least he convinces me, that unbridled freedom of action, permissiveness and so on, uh, doesn't work. Uh, and the question then, how much freedom of individual action can a society afford to have is totally different from the question, how far has science left us with uh, a viable concept of freedom? But then thirdly, uh, it seems to me we've got to separate out the question which seems to have been behind your probings. Um, what presuppositions of worthwhileness, what it is worthwhile to live to do, underlie Skinner's own recommendations? Mr. Skinner um, says, for example, that he sees survival as, I'm not sure if he said the only, but at any rate, the, the most defensible of values. But I simply don't believe, from my own personal knowledge of him, that he would regard it as good in some other sense if the society that managed to survive did so by becoming bestially cruel and repressive and, in fact, uh, fostered all the negative values which are the opposite of those that Professor Skinner himself shows in private life, for example. So I'd like to hear him qualify this assertion of his, that he's content that survival should be the only value. I believe that as a man, Mr. Skinner, like the rest of us, would disapprove and more than emotively would, as it were, classify as something not to be aimed at, uh, disapprove of, a society which went in such a direction in order to survive that it destroyed the sort of subsidiary values, perhaps he would say, I would say primary values, of human relationships. Um, 
love, compassion, but sympathy, if, and if so they are, if they are subsidiary, isn't that precisely the point? Uh, uh, does, does, I put that does, in quotes. So that's what I think yes. you might want to say. They were. I say they're primary. But but can't you therefore guess Mr. Skinner's answer, well, or let's let him make it? Well, it seems to me that we have demonstrated, with whatever relevant history we have, that that this vision of a totalitarian or despotic domination through punitive control just, uh, just is not true. Now, if you take another species, say the lion, the lion in his natural habitat survives entirely by killing and eating other animals, and he dominates the field, and so far as a lion goes, that certainly is his survival value, and it's done very well for lions until man learns how to capture lions in other ways and to use them for his own purposes in other ways. But the human organism can be controlled, it's been abundant evidence, uh, through punitive methods. Well, just take, take Hitler's Germany, for example. Yeah. It looked for a time as if that might indeed survive and be the dominant pattern for a long time to come, a thousand years, I think, uh, Hitler thought it might be. But something was wrong with it. Now, what was wrong with it? Can, is it? Is it not true that a culture which uses punitive methods is unable to marshal allies in its support? It, uh, it certainly enables its enemies to, to, to get support from others. I, I submit that Nazi Germany, which looked for a time to be so successful with, it, with a knock on the door in the middle of the night, was actually building its own destruction because these techniques do not lead to, they, 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 they create the conditions which, because of our genetic endowment, we oppose and draw away from and attack whenever we can. Would you say as much about the Soviet Union? I don't know enough about, the, about whether, well, the extent me. to which they are punitive. Uh, this is, this is, uh, I, I, <laughs> have, I, have, I have visited the Soviet Union. I've never seen the only, only policeman I ever saw with an arm gun, or the gun on his side, was guarding the TV station, and I don't, don't, didn't see one out here, but uh, the other ones I've been in the last two weeks, you have to go through a police cordon to get to, uh, to the studio. And for very good reasons, if you're going to take over, you grab the TV stations. I don't know how punitive the culture is, and I don't know how uh, punitive the, the Chinese culture is. Um, if they are you smart, you, they will you, you move away You do acknowledge that there is a scholarship on the subject, don't you? I'm sorry? You acknowledge that there is a scholarship on the subject, Robert Conquest. Oh, yes, instance. of course, uh -huh. of course. Yes. But now... Um, uh, the, 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 only reason I, the, reason, the only reason I mention that is because it seems to me that if you're dealing in universals, it becomes important to ask ourselves if there was something naturally wrong, genetically, if you like, wrong in the system mm. that consigned uh, an end to the experiment of Hitler, we ought to be perhaps more hopeful than we have uh, any recent reason to be about the end of that kind of thing in China or in Russia. Well, there's still a question, though, uh, whether this is more than a pious hope. Yes, I agree. I mean, it sounds yeah. like a certain kind of religious view uh, which... Uh, perhaps is one that I would share, though I don't often think of it in those terms, which is that uh, given that God is good and has standards of what's fair and right and so on, evil will not in the long run survive. But I think it would be over simple to take that uh, metaphysical statement and translate it into a prediction uh, about a particular stretch of history. I think uh, one way of putting it is that uh, God's long suffering is much longer than our logic. Yeah. Uh, we think that he ought long ago to have wiped us all out because there's so much cruelty. He still waits and says, how long will you kick against the goads of conscience? Mm -hmm. uh, so that I personally wouldn't like to take the optimistic view that anyone who goes in for cruelty as a way of um, ensuring survival, anyone who goes in for the destruction of some of the uh, higher values, as they were traditionally called, higher than mere survival, uh, is bound to come Self across. Self-destruct. Uh, I think it would be nice if that were true, and yeah. I doubt it. But when, I wonder, you use the word, when you use the word God, you are dealing with a metaphor or not? No, I would take this in the specific uh, Christian religious sense. Yeah. Uh, God as one, as one to be reckoned with. Gonna... No, I, I, when I listen to that sort of thing, I'm running a translation inside, of yeah. course. I think, the, I think that the, the good, whether represented, uh, personified in God, does represent those things which we find, to use a technical term, reinforcing. They are the things which induce us to behave in certain ways, and evil is uh, well, uh, the, the, the ordinary Christian picture of hell is a collection of all the aversive stimuli available at the time. It did not have electric shock because it wasn't available. But this, this, these are the things. I, I should like to go back to your opening remark. 
when Milton mm -hmm. Satan falls from heaven, he ends in hell. And what does he say to reassure himself? Here at least we shall be free. And yep. that, I think, is the fate of the old-fashioned liberal. He's going to be free, but he's going to find himself in hell. Well, I think that may be true of the old-fashioned liberal. Uh, I, think, I think, indeed, what Milton was on about there was the kind of freedom that wanted to be free from God. We agree, wouldn't we? I mean, that was a theological point he was making, that a man who supposes that his real freedom is to be free of God uh, is a man who is creating hell for himself. But it seems to me we've really got to try and get clear this, um, as I see it, logical fallacy underlying what Mr. Skinner said just now. I'd like to see if he would agree. Because he said he was doing translating when I was talking. And I think that this is a recurrent fallacy in a great deal of reductionist uh, philosophizing based on psychology and, and uh, physiology. Um, and I think the best way to show it is in terms of uh, an analogy. Suppose that uh, an engineer came into an area where there were computers running and a lot of people standing around and anxiously worrying about whether their equations were well conditioned and as to how many roots the equations had and so on. This engineer might, if he knew enough electronics, develop a complete mechanical explanation of all that's going on in front of these people purely in electronic terms. All right? In other words, you don't need anything but electronics in order to account, in a certain sense, for everything that's happening in the computer. On the other hand, when the mathematicians who are watching the computers say that they are cons uh, watching the solution of Poisson's equation or something like that, they are not making a translation of what the engineer says, nor is he making a translation of what they say. It's a logical mistake to regard the one as a translation of the other. They are correlates, but not translations. And if the engineer, if, uh, I, Mr. Skinner won't mind a little tease, if the engineer were to pursue his fallacy and write a book called Beyond Mathematics <laughs> on the ground that he had discovered how to make a translation of all the math quotes of all the mathematicians were saying without mentioning any mathematical concepts, he'd just be laughed at. They'd say, what can you do with such a man? He's making a fool of himself. Now, I do think it's most important to face this one, that as a matter of logical analysis, talking about uh, reinforcements and so on at uh, Professor Skinner's mechanistic level, or talking about nerve impulses and so on at mine, which I practice just as mechanistically as he does, these are not translations of what people say when they talk either about people or when they talk about God. We are talking about the significance of what's going on in the mechanical level in the kind of way that the mathematicians are talking about the mathematical significance of what's going on in the computer. And these are not translations, but correlates. So if I may come back to my point, I believe uh, that God is to be reckoned with in something of the same sense that uh, Mr. Skinner and yourself and all of us who are alive are to be reckoned with, i.e., not merely as objects, but as people who know, that's at the human level, and God is at least to be reckoned with as one who knows us, as we know one another. If that's true, I'm not saying that I'm proving it's true, but I'm saying if it's true, then it will not do logically to uh, regard talk in these terms merely as a translation of talk at the other level, any more than it does to regard talk at, uh, in the mathematical level as a translation of electronics. Conceptually, they are not saying the same thing, even though they're correlates of one another. Would you care to modify the use of the word translation? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, how technical are we allowed to get on oh, this program? Uh, yeah, yeah. I criticized a passage of yours in a recent book of mine. I don't know if you ever saw it or not, but you said something of the same sort about an electric advertisement in Times Square. You have all the bulbs and so on, and mm -hmm. you could take it all apart and analyze it uh, in terms of the circuitry and whatnot, and you wouldn't find the advertisement. This, uh, this suggests to me the fallacy of the structuralist the Levi-Strauss in, uh, in uh, anthropology, Chomsky in linguistics and so on, who wish to, to take behavior without regarding the situation in which the, which the behavior occurs. Mm. Because obviously there, the advertisement is not to be found in that array of bulbs. It is to be found in the effect on a, a person who is looking at it, and it depends a great deal upon his history as to what he sees there and what he, what he does in return. Now as to the translation, I would, when I wasn't translating in the way in which you thought, I was trying to go back to what I took to be the original version 
of which, to my mind, the theories of God are translations. I think that men have evolved a conception of God in some sense to represent the good, which I think can be reduced to what we find as positively reinforcing. And they have, made, they have conceptualized the devil or evil to take care of aversive stimuli in general. So that when you were talking, I was trying to get back to what I thought was something prior, not something I was translating after you spoke, but I was, I was trying to find out what you were translating with this metaphor of, of, of God. You know what you see? Uh, that doesn't get away from the fallacy. Uh, I give it the general uh, name of nothing buttery. That, you know, the, the no smoking sign is nothing but ink on cardboard, so we'll go on smoking. Uh, talk about B.F. Skinner as a man is nothing but talk about a piece of meat of a certain size uh, wobbling up and down emitting sound waves. So I'll ignore, <laughs> so I'll ignore his views. Or at least I'll only calculate what I can do to the nervous system by emitting sound waves in return. This nothing buttery is uh, fallacious. And what I'm saying is... I agree, is, you see. Uh, well, fine. Yes. Then, you see, you've got to face the point that if there were God, suppose that there really is God, as there mm. really is B.F. Skinner, yeah. and suppose that he, in some sense, is aware of us as we are aware of one another, then it doesn't do to suppose it's an answer to his claims on us to say, oh, well, you only came to know these claims through uh, your upbringing and through discovering that certain things were reversive. That's the mechanical explanation of how you came to see the thing. Just as, if I may take another illustration, Pythagoras' theorem is something which all of us, I suppose, and Skinner would know more about this than I, all of us came to believe to be true through a particular process which could be regarded in manipulative terms as getting the, uh, the hook up in our brains right or something so that we say, aha, yes. Well, no matter what story and how complete a story you tell there, that Pythagoras' theorem is true is something you don't affect by that story. And similarly, I'm you saying... You mean it's true irrespective of your it's perception? True it's either true or false. I mean, yeah. maybe false, but if it's, if it's true, then its truth isn't affected by a story as to how you came to see it to be true. And similarly with God, I'm not suggesting that coming to know God is as simple as coming to know one another. Uh, there are all sorts of epistemological barriers, not least the fact that Milton was pointing to that at heart we would rather not know God. We would rather not have God interfering with our private lives and so on. But I am saying that if a man does begin to come to know God in the way that's been recognized uh, down through the ages by those who did come to know God, then the mechanical, the mechanical story, the mechanics of how he came to know God isn't going to be logically possible as a refutation of the reality of the God whom he's come to know. To put it graphically, uh, suppose that you were standing, as it were, from God's side and listening to people arguing that God didn't exist. Uh, it would sound a little bit odd if the argument were based on the fact that people's brains had to grow embryonically with a certain structure and people's society had to interact in a certain way in order that people should come to know God. Of course, some story like that must be true. If Professor Skinner's particular theories of this are inadequate or wrong, someone else's one day, I hope, will be correct. All I'm saying is, don't let's commit the logical fallacy of nothing but of supposing this debunks the God whom one thus comes to know. Well, uh, is, 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 it, uh, uh, is it alien to your system, Mr. Skinner, uh, to, to, uh, to exclude the possibility of its being uh, in error? Not a bit, no. Uh, there's a great deal that the system does not by any means uh, take account of now. That is one of the great difficulties of being a psychologist. A physicist um, never has to deal with anything very much more complicated than the things he's working on. Uh, if you took uh, physics a uh, hundred years ago and presented uh, the physicist with, with that television camera, and you say, you, you say you have a science of electricity, let's see you explain that. Well, he wouldn't, wouldn't do it. There must be a gremlin inside throwing pictures around. I can't explain that at all. Now, unfortunately, the psychologist is always in the presence of the most complex phenomena that he has to, has to deal with. He sees himself having strange little memories, solving problems apparently intuitively, and so on. As 
So we are always faced with the, the most difficult projects. And I am perfectly content to leave some things for later solution and to get on with the simple. I still feel it's not, nothing buttery is not representing my position at all. I would not use the word ma machine or mechanic at all. I believe that you have, you have misinterpreted me because I never had dealt with a, with a rat simply as a piece of meat, even a piece of living meat. I am much more concerned with what, in the human case, we would have called the person of the rat, which would mean yeah. the, the organism in its relation to its controlling variables. I want all of those in. That is what I believe the structuralists do leave out of account, mm. and I think you want to bring them in, but I do too. Sure. And I do, but I'm, I'm no theologian. I don't know how this applies to the existence of God. I rather like those uh, theologians who have said, however, that God is much too complex for us to understand, and let's not try. Well, that might be a, a too easy way out if it's God cop -out, is prepared to um, cop -out. <laughs> take an initiative in it. But let me come back and agree on two points. I think that, uh, if I may say so, I think Mr. Skinner has been wronged by some critics by making this argument, which they'd never dare to apply to physics. Uh, you've got a simple laboratory situation. They say, how absurd of you to think that what you learn in that could ever apply in the complexity of the real world. That's not fair. All science, physics, any other, uh, has to be developed in a laboratory situation. Uh, physics sometimes can simplify. For instance, it can treat a, a missile as a mass, uh, almost at a point, and so on. At a what at, as a mass? As, as a mass at a point. You know, oh. physics, uh, the, uh, physics, physics equations apply to, ma to point masses, the simplest ones. And so you can approximate a missile, or indeed a man, uh, by a point mass if he's flying in empty space. And that's how physics gets away with so much. But ask a physicist to predict the fall of a leaf and he'll have just as much difficulty as Mr. Skinner has in predicting the behavior of individuals in society. Uh, I think, in other words, it's quite unfair to, to accuse him uh, just on the ground that his work is developed in a lab. I think if, if I were to take some of the things he says at their face value... Please uh, do. For instance, <laughs> uh, the occasions on which he suggests that we now uh, know enough to start rather big experiments on uh, manipulation of society, mm -hmm. then I think that's a bit difficult. That's a bit like a physicist saying, we now know enough to be able to predict how leaves fall uh, someday. Well, uh, that's one point. I just thought uh, I ought to say that this is uh, unfair uh, just to blame him for using lab things, though I would uh, feel unhappy about some of the extrapolations he makes. I think that they're much too optimistic and that you know, a really tough-minded scientist who took him by the scruff of the neck and said, where have you got lab evidence for saying you could apply that in the next thousand years, let alone in the next ten years? Uh, May I illustrate? I'm not sure that uh, he'd be able to answer in the more complex ones. You want to I, mean, I try. Yes, sir. I try. <clears throat> um, one of the things we've done in the laboratory over the last 20 or 30 years is to analyze so-called schedules of reinforcement. Now, all of this, all that complicated verbiage means is that we are studying the ways in which the consequences of behavior are contingent upon what an organism is doing in a given situation. And one of the things that we've worked out is an elaborate classification of different kinds of, of contingencies, and those can be discovered once you see them in the laboratory, and they were not seen before then, they can be discovered in the world at large. For example, if you go to Las Vegas, uh, you will see people engaging in an enormous amount of behavior, pulling on slot machine handles, betting on roulette and playing uh, Chemin de Fer and so on. This is behavior, its behavior is sustained at the highest level of intensity. I mean, yeah. uh, just a fantastic preoccupation. Why? Well, the analyst, psychoanalyst would say perhaps that these people are punishing themselves because they're always going to lose eventually. Or you might say they do it because of the excitement. The feeling leads them to do this and so on. What? They're doing it because all gambling devices have built into them a particular type of schedule, so-called variable ratio schedule. And it will make a compulsive gambler out of a pigeon or a rat or a monkey or a child or the people who go to Las Vegas. Now, I contend that although I am not now 
and I, I would not allow myself to design better gambling apparatuses as I could do, but I, I, <laughs> I, I contend... Better in the sense this, of, of more extractive? For the, better for the entrepreneur. He would get the money out of the pockets faster. Gotcha. Oh. That could be done very easily, yes. But, no, but I, I'm not saying that I am now ready to give an expansive description of culture, but I am ready to point to a feature. Hmm. And a very important feature because we're proud of the fact that we have so much leisure these days. But what do we do in this leisure? Well, all the states are setting up lotteries to get people something to look forward to at the end of the week when there's going to be a drawing and, and so on. And it's done because you can get money away from citizens with this kind of reinforcement and they won't throw you out of office. If you raise taxes, they'll throw you out of office. Now, the contingencies which lead people to set up gambling systems are also part of the contingencies of reinforcement. Now, I'm not saying I am now ready to design a culture. I did that in Walden too, but it was, it was hypothetical. It ah. But I, I am ready to, <laughs> I'm ready to, to interpret features okay. of our own culture in the light of laboratory processes. And I, I insist that what we have learned from these control situations is showing new light on what is happening in the world at large. Well, this is fine. I mean, this is the, the hypothetical deductive method of science where you go tentatively to a point at which you've got roughly equal chances of being right and wrong, not too grossly uh, likely to go wrong, and, of course, not too grossly likely to go right, or the verification will be trivial. Uh, I have no objection to that, in principle, you know, done with humility and all that. But what bothers me is the extraordinary misconception, if that's all that uh, Mr. Skinner means, extraordinary misconception of the public image which uh, people seem to have of him. For example, he said just now that he wasn't a theologian and he wasn't prepared to say that there was anything wrong, I suppose it was, with what I was saying about God. Well, this is extremely important because, again, if I may, suppose there is God, and I believe there is then certainly the facts that Skinner and others find out are God's facts, which he'll expect us to use in humility for the betterment of the human race, subject to other uh, criteria of human dignity and responsibility and so on, which we haven't yet got on, got on to. They're his facts, and we have him to thank for them, even uh, the work which, uh, in fact, especially the sort of work that Professor Skinner has been able to do in a way which leaves no room for doubt after we baptize but, uh, it. No, 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 this is the point, you see. Just as you thank God for your daily bread, so you thank him for anything you find in science, even if you don't explicitly baptize it in any ritual way. But my point is that if there is God, and if he's holding us responsible for using these facts as well as any other facts for the betterment of humankind according to his standards, then nothing is more important, it seems to me, than to reverse the... Uh, wheel of uh, accelerating misunderstanding that somehow or other behavioristic psychology has got rid of God, has debunked religion, and so on. I think this is uh, a crime against the name of an empirical science, that it should be alleged and thought to have these consequences. And if Skinner agrees with me, I think it may make a big difference to the reception that his empirical proposals get. If he ties them, or if, if people generally tie them up in, in a package deal with get rid of religion, get rid of traditional this and that, then, uh, of course, those who feel there's something wrong because in their own experience they, you know, they can't find that what he says rings true about religion, uh, then they're going to have all sorts of mental resistance to the purely empirical proposals that he has in mind. Well, would you say that your system is incoherent at the hands of a Christian? Oh, that's a very complicated statement. You I think that we are, we are we are oscillating here between God and religion when I make a distinction. Uh, are you, are, uh, what do you... Um, I, I am in no position to pronounce any judgment on the existence or non-existence of God. I can pronounce judgments on the effect that religion has had on our culture. Now, is that... Are you raising that problem or not? No, no. I think um, I, I am certainly speaking from... A Christian point of view, a biblical Christian point of view, taking as far as I can see the sort of position about theism that um, the church traditionally has, that the Bible presents. Um, but I think that, uh, as far as I can see, the fault of the church down through the ages has not been that it has practiced theism as biblically set out, but rather that it hasn't. 
And uh, it may well be that some of those who are most vociferous against what they call religion today would find themselves echoing the sort of thing that, say, the Old Testament prophets said about the established church of their day. I do think we ought to stick to what amounts to an empirical claim uh, that the New Testament makes, that there is God and that if a man's ready for the consequences of coming to grips with God, God is prepared to come to grips with him. That's an empirical claim. It's that that I think we should first concentrate on because if there is God, then he will be prepared to open men's eyes to what's wrong in established religion if there is something wrong, uh, even though the established religion has spoken in the name of God. Well, so I agree there's a distinction between the two, and I think the important question is the empirical one. Was Jesus Christ telling the truth uh, in the sense uh, of, if you like, an experiment? Is it true today what he says can happen to a man not through weird experiences or, or mystical nonsense, but through the ordinary day-to-day -day experiences of his life? Is that true? Uh, there are many people here, here and now or in the future world? No, I mean, uh, here and now, for, for, for you and me, if we approach God in the sort of spirit that Christ uh, showed. You're not giving us Pascal's wager now. No, no, oh, no, okay. not, not in the statistical sense. Well, uh, Mr. Skinner, you said a moment ago that you are equipped and uh, authoritatively uh, to comment on uh, religion insofar as it has played a role in, uh, in our culture. Now, uh, is anything that you would be prepared to say on that subject contradictory to what Mr. Mackay uh, has ventured? Well, I'm having a little trouble digesting what he has said, and uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you, yes or no, that it would be contradictory. What I meant by commenting upon religion as such, I, I'm in no position to give you a complete account of religion any more than a complete account of anything else. But the whole the history of comparative religion and so on throws some light on why men have, have composed religions, religious practices and documents and texts and so on. And that is a part of, uh, of, um, of, the, of the subject matter of the science of behavior. It's not one I've specialized in, and I, and I would not want to go very much further in it. I would expose my ignorance. I think that's very important, that it is, the, uh, the science of religion is an empirical science like any other. The study of the extent to which uh, religious notions and practices correspond or don't, and what history they've had. Uh, a Christian is obligated to the God of truth to go into that area with an open mind and listen and look. Uh, just as any other. But uh, again, I think uh, Mr. Skinner would probably agree, if there were God, if I'm trying to put it in a neutral way, if there were God, and if, as one of the ancient uh, fathers said, uh, he has made us for himself so that our hearts are restless till they find rest in him, the old expression. If that were true, then of course you would expect to find the sort of thing you do find, that throughout the world, uh, in a very great variety of tribal conditions and so on, some kind of restlessness, some kind of uh, religious um, aspiration and so on is found. So I'd say that at the very least, the data of comparative religion are neutral here, and uh, I think perhaps Skinner's not denying this. Well, let me ask you this rather more directly, Mr. Skinner, in the light of the publicity that your book uh, uh, has gotten. Uh, it seems, seems to me that most people understand it to, to say that there is no uh, consideration beyond the cultural consideration that uh, uh, would inhibit the planners of uh, your utopia from having uh, their way. Whereas by contrast, for instance, there is the, uh, in many ways, distinctively religious notion that certain things you can't do to a human being. Uh, some of the anti-abortion, for instance, uh, a sentiment uh, is based uh, essentially on that view. Now, uh, would you say, therefore, returning and, and recasting the question I asked you a moment ago, would you say that it is incompatible to believe in your system if one simultaneously entertains religious beliefs uh, which uh, activate uh, this feeling about uh, the essence of the individual human being and his untouchability? 
Well, I think there is an incompatibility to this extent that uh, religion, and particularly the Christian religion, has emphasized uh, the uniqueness of the individual and his contribution, his role, his self-determined individual who make, can make choices, he is to be held responsible and uh, sub subjected to the most wonderful rewards or the most vicious punishments uh, portrayed in hell and so on. I think it has been an effort to rally the individual, to strengthen him to the, the fullest extent, and has joined with the literature of democracy, which has done a somewhat similar thing with respect to earthly powers and so on. This is all part of, of, the, of the advancement of a literature of freedom, and I don't want to, want to give the impression that I'm against that at all. I think it was terribly important at one stage in our culture for the individual to be strengthened against controlling forces of one kind or another. But that does not mean that the individual originates control any more than the despotic forces originated it. And to call all control wrong simply because we have emphasized the kinds we don't like is to overlook the great danger that we are being controlled when we don't know it and when we are doing things that we feel we want to do and we feel free. I don't believe that the feeling of freedom is, is a proper criterion here. Could I come in on that yes. one because this was something we had postponed. Um, I think, you see, uh, that Christianity, if we go into it, uh, comes down on both sides of that fence. On the one hand, it does, of course, say that each individual will have to stand before God and answer for the use he's made of his opportunities and so on. On the other hand, it, it emphasizes that we are members one of another, and it, uh, it is indeed diametrically opposed to the sort of uh, liberal tradition which Milton was uh, caricaturing. Uh, but the question in my mind is not uh, is it a good idea to recognize our freedom but is it a fact that we are free and I would like just to mention why I think it is a fact you see if you take an outsider's view of a system whether it's a mechanical mechanically conceived system or a psychologically conceived system then in principle you could imagine that we could if we were the outsiders see enough of the of the game to be able to predict the outcome of a man's choice let's say and this might lead us, and I think somehow, sometimes it's led Skinner to suggest, that therefore, if he feels free, he's just under an illusion, you see. Oddly enough, this isn't the case. If the prediction of the action that the man has yet to choose to take in the psychological, uh, ordinary, uh, psychological, uh, operationally defined sense of choose, if that prediction depends on the state of his brain, then even though we had a complete specification of the outcome, that specification couldn't be equally accurate whether or not he believed it, all right? Because yeah. his brain, if he believed it, couldn't be in the state that uh, we took into account when making the prediction. So there doesn't exist, when you have to choose, and I'll finish with this because I don't want to make it too, too long, uh, if you have to make a choice in uh, the normal sense, then even though your brain were as mechanical as the solar system, there doesn't exist a specification of the outcome with an unconditional claim to your ascent, in the logical sense, a well-founded claim to your ascent, unconditionally. Because either it's been uh, predicated on your not believing it, in which case if you were to believe it, you'd be mistaken, mm -hmm. or else if you're clever enough, you might be able to cook it into a form which if you believed it, it would knock your brain into a state which would make it then come true, but then, by the same token, you would not be mistaken if you disbelieved it, because if you disbelieved it, your brain would not be in the condition it presupposed. So that, in that sense, a man who faces a normal choice is free, i.e., there doesn't, he is correct to believe in the non-existence of an unconditional specification of the outcome. May now, I, that, that, that's, I think, what makes us responsible, and it has no tendency whatever to deny the mechanistic explicability of the causes from the outside. Again, it's the nothing but a fallacy. If you confuse those two levels of analysis, the spectator analysis, which is the proper one for Skinner and me in our professional capacity, if you confuse that with the agent's own, the actor's analysis, then you make a logical nonsense. And the odd fact is, I believe, that corresponding to a deterministic, even a deterministic spectator analysis, the agent's own view, correct view, logically correct view, is that the outcome is as yet undetermined. 
May I just, I do not want to get back to theology, but I would remind you that it no, is determined if there is an omniscient God who knows what you're going to do. No, no, I think that's very important. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's another All right. common fallacy. Well, let's not get back well, to theology, just, though. Just May the I comment, no, though, I'm on sorry. the systems analysis? No, no, you're not going to get away with that one. Uh, even an omniscient God cannot specify the outcome oh of a choice you haven't yet made in a form which he can equally claim your assent whether you accept it or not. This is good. And that's the Turian doctrine, and I well, was raised in it too. This isn't a matter of doctrine at all. <laughs> this is a matter of <laughs> this is a matter of logical analysis. Uh, no, it's, it's not. One, no, it's, let, it's let, one of the it's one of the well-known yeah. misinterpretations of the doctrine of divine sovereignty. That you can't have free will and, and that, divine omniscience. Right. No. But this is a fallacy. May I claim equal time? Sure. <laughs> they will get to the um, panel here. No, this Professor Mackay has. Uh, approach this problem from, from the point of view of a systems analysis or an information theory analysis backed up by brain circuits and whatnot uh, and logic. Now, it, it's customary to accept logic before there was any human behavior at all. Man was born into a world equipped with, with logic, you see. It was all there waiting to be applied. I insist that the, the, the real fallacy is believing in truth or falsity or any of the other truth value systems which logic has proposed, we need an empirical logic which will be based upon what men are actually doing when they are arguing logically. And I do not believe they are approximating some kind of truth system which lies beyond them. This is a, a basic disagreement, and I, no, I would be willing to... It's not. Nobody's been talking about truth systems. I think there are statements which can be recognized to be incompatible and they can be incompatible oh, within a particular yes. system. A and what I'm a. saying is that the statement that a man is free and faces an undetermined choice is not incompatible with the statement from an observer standpoint that the mechanical processes giving rise to his behavior are determinate. That's what I'm saying. And this, you don't mm -hmm. avoid the point by going in to talk, and talk about truth Thanks. systems either. Mr. Hart. Well, Mr. Skinner, in uh, your research, you've uh, thoroughly discuss the flaws of punitive systems and for example say in the United States where we allude to the fact that freedom abounds how would you say uh, uh, discuss or explain something like Attica or uh, it's well from that. well Attica you say yeah. Isn't yes. that sort well, of a programming I, I, in itself? Of course, I don't know the facts uh, but I know the type of fact which prevailed there and, and I have some feelings about why violence occurred as it did. A very interesting experiment in a penal institution, a National Training School for Boys, was done uh, three or four years ago in Washington, D.C., before it was moved out of Washington, and a book will be published this month about that. This was an effort to give those who have to be incarcerated for a given period of time something to do. The ordinary system in, the, in a prison of that kind is utter boredom. It is the problem of all of us when we have leisure. And I believe it is possible, and a good deal of work is being done in applying what we call operant conditioning to the design of prison systems to give prisoners positive reasons for behaving well while they are in prison and acquiring skills, not being forced to, but really actively acquiring the kinds of skills which will give them a slightly better chance to take their place in society if they get out and when they get out. I, I am convinced that that, is a, that, that Attica business is, is, a, is a signal flag, and we have to pay attention to it. And the change is not to air-conditioned prisons or anything like that. It is to give the life of the prisoner in the prison some, some pattern. And that can be done by redesigning the contingencies of reinforcement that prevail if I get technical again. Excuse me. Ms. Wilson. Mr. Mackay, um, you base a lot of your statements on you know, the fact that you believe there is a God. But, and I seem to um, understand that you think that in the end, e good will prevail over evil. But do you ever take into the account that since evil seems to be the one of the main forces in the world, you know, as opposed to good, that in the end evil will prevail over good? Well, um, this really goes back to the reason why one believes in God. I mean, if it's a matter of speculatively saying, you know, I'll bet on there being a God, uh, then I dare say what you're saying ought to be a real headache. But if what one uh, if what happens is that a man discovers to his surprise, if I say so, from a position of agnosticism, that the kind of thing that Jesus Christ said about 
uh, God and God's readiness to come to grips with us uh, was true, was beginning to come true in one's own experience. Then, of course, uh, you can't get away from the whole background out of which that claim came. And part of that is, as we all know, is that God's attitude to the evil in his world is typified by the life of Christ when he came in contact with it. On the one hand, compassionate and seeking to bring good into evil and sometimes out of evil. On the other hand, prepared not to beat it down with military might, but even prepared to allow the evil to crucify God in Christ. Now, this is clearly not simple. I don't profess to understand it, but it warns me off any simplistic notion that I can say syllogistically, God is all-powerful, he doesn't like evil, therefore evil ought to be abolished. Because when, according to the, the Bible, the God in whom I believe was one who, when he came among evil men, even allowed them to crucify him. So I've got to think again. And here I think it's <coughs> parallel to science. It's no good my having preconceived ideas as to what the facts about God ought to be. If God has done anything to show them to us, to reveal them to us, I've got to sit down before those facts like a little child, to quote T. H. Huxley about science, uh, just as I have to sit down before the facts of the physical world or the psychological world like a little child. Now, a smart child, mind you, we've got to try and think. It's not naivete that's wanted, but readiness to learn. Pin your eyes and ears open, so to speak, because unless God tells you these things, you'll never find them out. You can't find them out for yourself. Which eyes and ears? Hmm? Which eyes and ears does God speak and, uh, and, and show you through? That's a metaphor. Ah, yes. Psycho some psychologists understand <laughs> metaphor. Mr. Tracy. Mr. Skinner, you mentioned, your theory mentions, the notion of scheduled behavior in human beings. Do you think it's practical, not possible, but practical, put this theory into effect outside of a laboratory situation or a prison situation? For example, is it possible to do this in Mayor Daly, Chicago? In, in, uh, in Chicago? Or New York yes. or Boston? Well, uh, there are certainly engineering problems that are far beyond our reach at the moment. And I don't mean to say that any one person, Mayor Daly or anyone else, is going to be put in the power with this technology of solving his problems. But one by one, you can take areas and solve problems in them. For example, the school system in Chicago, I dare say, is no better than the school systems anywhere else. Most students study because they don't dare do anything else. They don't dare not study. Now, that's very bad for everyone. They don't learn very much. The teacher's problem is difficult. Students don't enjoy what they're doing. They drop out or, or leave as quickly as they can and so on. You could, I think, without any question, if you could get, if you could persuade the authorities to make the proper changes, completely re revolutionize the school system in Chicago within one year, so that children would come to school gladly and not dragging their heels, would sit down and get to work and study something and learn extremely efficiently. That can be done by arranging the proper contingencies of reinforcement. I would say the same thing about incentive systems for productive labor. You take one by one uh, these areas and you can do something with them. Mr. Hart. Uh, Mr. Pakai, if I'm not mistaken, one of the major flaws you found with uh, Dr. Skinner's uh, theory is the programming element. That You just can't deal with the fact that there's going to be someone who programs our culture correctly. How would you describe, say, the governmental programming or just programming in modern society, would you describe it as excessive or adequate, or could you expand on that? I'm not sure I recognize what you're alluding to. I don't think I could claim <coughs> to have really referred to that aspect as a fallacy. I think that it may be undesirable to allow things to go as freely as uh, Dr. Skinner would. Um, I think, you see, uh, that even if you don't take a Christian view of man, but a view uh, which is rather widespread and sometimes called humanistic, view of man, then one of the things that you long for in each individual is the sort of thing you long for when you're bumping a car that won't start round a, round a block. You long for the engine to start running on its own and, you know, get its own momentum. And in that sense, you want the car to be free from you, not always dependent on your bumping. So I would say that it's not, uh, I agree with Skinner, that from a mechanical standpoint, he doesn't like the word, but I, I regard it as mechanistic psychology, this, it's, uh, it's technology. Uh, from a mechanical standpoint, we can't help uh, 
conditioning one another and reinforcing one another and so on and what he's saying is let's be conscious of this and let's do it consciously I say all right let's do that but let's watch the effect this has on the initiatives which the individual can develop and I would say that uh, for example a great deal would de uh, in, in the sort of things he proposes would depend on how public the schedule of reinforcement was uh, allowed to be uh, the directly people begin to say, uh-uh, I don't want you to know what I'm doing to you, then I think it's begun to be unacceptable. Ethically? Ethically, yeah. and I would say, indeed, politically. Yeah. Ms. Wilson. Okay, uh, Dr. Skinner, uh, with your system, you know, assuming that it could be made operative, I'd like to know a couple of things. First of all, how do you deal with the attitudes of people and uh, taking the attitudes into, of well, there, yeah, there are two things. Yes. Taking into account um, perhaps the basic fear in most men that there is a God, and then uh, what happens if people don't want your system? Well, there are those very different questions. I don't believe that attitudes are the causes of behavior. I don't think you do something because you have an attitude in that direction or an opinion in that direction. The attitude is inferred from the behavior, and if you accept attitudes as explanations, you tend not to look elsewhere. I want to know why people behave as they do. And uh, certainly, when you say he, he acts as if he had a positive or negative attitude toward Mayor Daley, for example, uh, then we, we, what, what is he doing? Is he going out and campaigning against him and so on? These are the behaviors which suggest the attitude, the why he does this, will, be, will depend on what has happened to him as a citizen, a citizen of Chicago. Now, I've forgotten the second point. Um, it was um, then assuming that most men have a basic fear oh, of God. Oh, well, there again, uh, you see, you're appealing to a feeling as if it were a cause of behavior. I don't want to try to modify feelings. I want to modify the behavior, and the feelings will come along with it. If, if you want someone, if I were a theologian interested in, in making people feel that there is a God or to believe it, I would, I would do such things as, as, as would lead them to behave as what, as what you would say is a manner which indicates that, their belief, that they believe in God, and the belief would come with the behavior. Uh, could I ask you something? I seem to be understanding from what you're saying, uh, well, as an example, that rather than going to church because you believe in God, you believe in God because you go to church. Well, I'm it's almost to, that. That's a little too simple. But yeah, well, this is, you, you know, You haven't mentioned analogy. why you believe or go to church. You see, there's a third mm -hmm. element to be mentioned here. And how would, you, how, how would you name it? Well, I would have to go back into the history of the, of the child and so on, what he's been told about the significance of, of attendance at church and all of that. Oh, Mr. Tracy, we have just a minute left. Professor Mordecai, in your position as a scientist, do you think that Skinner's proposals adequately, adequately allow for the role of a rebel or of a political nonconformist? Wow, what is the role of a rebel or a political nonconformist? I know it's fashionable, but uh, <laughs> what's it for? Well, I think probably it's, it's for opening people's eyes to things they may have overlooked. And I would say that only if the proposals that people like Skinner put forward are public proposals, open to scrutiny and open to check and it's proper scientific evaluation. In other words, if you don't surround them with the mystique of the circus trainer, but get it out into the open where other scientists can take proper critical look at it, uh, it's only then that I think rebels and so on will have their scope. Indeed, I think uh, that's probably one of the biggest uh, flies in the whole Skinnerian ointment. Thank you very much, Mr. McClellan. Thank you very much, Mr. Skinner. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the panel. Thank you. For a printed copy of this program, send 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. That address again, Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>